My name is Lior Levy. I'm an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Haifa uh, in Israel. It's my second year at the Department of Philosophy. Prior to that, I got my uh, PhD at Temple University and I wrote my dissertation on Jean-Paul Sartre on his conception of memory, on memory in his early philosophy. My article, Thinking with Beauvoir on the Freedom of the Child, um, emerged from um, a return to the ethics of ambiguity. I decided to teach that text in my Intro to Continental Philosophy course, and I was reading through it, and it struck me as I was reading it that Beauvoir got uh, something wrong <laughs> with respect to children. I thought that the way she approached the question of childhood was too schematic or uh, that it didn't address or didn't give room to our own experience of um, being children and interacting with children as parents or teachers or, or friends or what have you. So I started thinking about a critique of uh, Beauvoir's position of childhood. First of all, I should say that I um, was very impressed by the fact that childhood even appeared in such an explicit manner in the text because philosophers overall tend to forget childhood or they think about the subject always as somehow fully mature, fully formed, and of course everything that goes with that, uh, possessing reason and knowing the good and so forth. And Beauvoir really made room for children in her text, though I thought that she didn't um, approach the topic um, in a sufficient manner. So I started writing, analyzing her analysis of childhood and the way that she thought of the relationship between childhood and freedom. And in Beauvoir, freedom has two senses. Um, first is ontological, that's related to the way in which we um, are able to position ourselves as subject vis-a-vis -vis the world and also in the world, uh, comprehending the world, conscious of a world, navigating ourselves, uh, acting, uh, fulfilling our tasks and so forth. So that's the first sense uh, of freedom in her work. And the second sense is a normative or moral sense which means that subjects have the ability that they can refuse, but Beauvoir thinks that that's of course morally wrong, uh, they have the ability to reflect on that initial ontological freedom and understand that they are in fact the sources of values, that they are the sources of meaning, and that they are the ones who make this world what it is, that is, they make it a human world. So we are first and foremost creatures who uh, are conscious of a world and constitute it as a particular world, a world that allows us to act in different ways, allows the, a, 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 a world that, that, um, that we uh, um, love or hate, that we find lovable or hateful or dreadful. So we constitute the world and then when we are morally free we understand that we are the ones that constitute the world thusly. So we don't think of the world as simply an objective entity that uh, has traits that were, I don't know, given to it by God or that were always there, but we understand that we participate in the constitution of the world. and in our own constitution, of course. So I started to analyze the way in which Beauvoir um, denies children uh, moral freedom in the text and uh, says that they are in fact incapable of realizing the extent in which they are the source of, of meaning, uh, that they are 
unable to reflect on their condition, that they take everything that they experience as um, God made. Uh, the God can be simply the father or the mother or the teacher, but they, that they never question. Beauvoir says the children never question the world and that they don't question the world because they cannot. They simply cannot reflect on their um, condition and then assess it. So in the second part of the paper, in my reading of the second sex, I show that children are not simply uh, unfree because they cannot will their ontological freedom, but they're unfree because various social and political institutions hinder them from achieving their freedom. And in that respect, I think that uh, we are responsible uh, with regard to the way that we invite children to explore their freedom and explore the world as a field of possibilities. So the, the, the overall um, argument in the paper is that Beauvoir presents two concept conceptions of children uh, and I examine the conception in the earlier work in the ethics of ambiguity. I discuss the Aristotel Aristotelian influence on Beauvoir's work and teleological undercurrents on her underlying her conception of childhood that I think it's interesting to note that they're there because as an existentialist Beauvoir of course did not think that humans have an essence or an end that they strive to fulfill and yet her account of childhood shows us that she does hold this position that being a complete individual is something that you reach once you've matured biologically and psychologically and you exited childhood and became a complete human being, a mature subject. So childhood is just a phase that we need to leave behind and that we need to outgrow. And it's important, not just biologically that we'll do it, but also morally for her that we'll do it. So that's the first part of the article. And the second part returns to her later and I think more nuanced, nuanced approach where, uh, where she examines the way that we restrict and, um, and limit the opportunities for children to explore the freedom that they can actually explore. So in, in the second sex we find that children can in fact, she thinks that they often refuse to assume a stance on their original freedom, but if they refuse to do it, it's because they can do it. So it's not that they are unable of doing so, that it's that they choose not to do so and we push them to, um, to um, avoid confronting their freedom in different ways. So the paper suggests that we turn to Beauvoir as a source for uh, developing a phenomenological account of childhood. So what is really phenomenology for Beauvoir and what do we do with that? Uh, phenomenology is um, a school of thought that was developed by Edmund Husserl and I think Beauvoir found it so valuable because it returns to the immediacy of our lived experience and lets us develop an account of meaning, um, of the meaningfulness of the world and our um, position in the world through and from that uh, immediate lived experience. So it takes the perspective of the first person and it seeks to examine how, uh, how things appear to to me, to you, okay, to each of us, when we reflect on the world, when we, when we uh, examine our our um, experience of living in the world. Now, we live in the world through our bodies, our experiences embodied, and we explore the world and navigate it through our um, our body, and Beauvoir notes that our bodies are, are different, that 
we have female bodies and we have male bodies and that they approach the world differently and that they navigate the world differently and experience the world differently. Now for Beauvoir, of course, uh, she operates in the field where she identifies that there, there was no room for an account of feminine experience. Experience was always um, described by men and, um, and it was not presented as necessarily masculine experience but just as experience full stop, right? So experience was thought to be universal, experience was thought to be absolute, uh, but of course those structures of universality and uh, absoluteness were male. So Beauvoir asks us to um, dismantle or examine the way in which culture, in which history, in which philosophy uh, structures those forms of meaning. She wants us to wreck them and return to our own experience as women in the world and, uh, and, and see again how, um, how those conceptions or values that were handed down to us limit or narrow down our experience and how if we bracket those conceptions we can give an account of, of, um, of lived reality that's not um, hindered or limited by those, um, by those um, cultural and, and historical um, frameworks. So in thinking about the ways in which um, society and culture uh, bog down women's bodies and uh, limit the ways that l women can explore the world with their bodies, right, by uh, the imperative to be feminine and to be uh, passive and to be, um, I don't know, gentle or soft or what have you, we actually uh, inscribe those traits onto our bodies and we, uh, we, when we, when this specificity become ingrained, we stop acting or, or limit the way that we act severely. Uh, so Beauvoir shows us that, that traditionally um, girls were um, assigned those certain traits and those traits were um, taken or presented as wholly natural, as belonging to their nature, as not something that's constituted by society and by our culture, but as something that belongs to the pure biological or physiological level of facts about our bodies and what they can or cannot do. So Beauvoir first wants to show us how in fact those brute, allegedly brute biological facts are actually cultural constructions. And then when we start thinking about it that way, this way, we see that, um, that we don't all begin our lives from the same neutral starting point, that we are handed down a very heavy load um, that we carry with us and that shapes the way that we assume positions, that we relate to one another, that we relate to our spouses, to our children, to ourselves, what we uh, even without being pro explicitly prohibited by others, we internalize those roles and we just think that that's, that's the way it is, that's the way that we um, have and will always face the world and face ourselves. So Beauvoir shows us that uh, those are not just simple facts, but are somehow um, cultural constructions. 
So at the very end of the paper, I uh, hint at the possibility, uh, I don't fully develop it, of using Beauvoir's work, using her later work in The Second Sex, uh, for developing a phenomenology of childhood that takes into account the basic uh, openness of childhood experience, the basic um, the possibility inherent in childhood experience of, of taking the world, its meaning and values as something open-ended, as something that we can act on, as something that we can question, as something that we can um, deal with in, in different ways. And I think that even though Beauvoir does not do it herself, she does not develop such a phenomenological, phenomenological account, her work does naturally lend itself to such, um, such an endeavor. What I suggest in the paper is that actually as we move away from childhood, we don't become more free or don't realize that we are actually the source of value and meaning, but we tend to forget it and we tend to hide it away from ourselves. And I think of conflicts, um, um, conflicts between individuals and conflicts on a greater scale as a sort of uh, proof of that forgetfulness because um, in conflict we assert the fact that we think that our own position is is absolute and that it is um, we think of our own narrative as the only narrative right and all other narrative is sort of illusions or 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 made up tales or something like that we think that there is you know the truth is monolithic and that it never changes and that there are no perspectives on it so I think that as we grow older we develop in many different ways also through our very own bodies, we develop habits that make that facilitate our action, that um, that make it easier for us to do things in the world, right? Even mundane things like riding bicycles or driving a car. So we fac we create all those habits, but those habits actually put us in a sort of automatic mode. We don't need to think of what we're doing, we're simply doing it. And since we're doing it over and over and over again, we think that that's the only way of doing it. And I think that Beauvoir shows us that childhood is a site where habits have not yet been fully formed, where values have not been accepted as given. So Beauvoir lets us return to that perpetual why that we hear from children so often, right? So you have to go to daycare today. Why? Because I have to go to work and there's no one to be with you. Why? Right? So there's that why, why, endless why. And I think, I mean, personally, I often experience annoyance when I hear that constant why because there's just there's no reason. That's the way things are, okay? And that's that's the way we do things, and that's the way we have to do things. And I think as, as adults, we often resort to that sort of, there's no explanation. That's just the way things are. And children don't accept that um, uh, that immediacy of the given. They, they puzzle over that. Um, they puzzle over that. They want to understand it. And sometimes they refuse to understand it and they point to how artificial it is or how um, arbitrary it is, right? And in that respect, I think that children have something very philosophical about them and that philosophy perhaps offers us a way of keeping in touch with childhood. So I don't want to romanticize childhood. I don't think of it as a sort of uh, paradise, as a sort of uh, moment in life that we need to idealize. In fact, I f I, in fact, I think that it's very difficult to be a child and that there's something really terrifying about that perpetual questioning, about that, uh, that instability or the, the kind of awareness of 
of uh, actions, decisions, institutions as rather arbitrary or the, as, as something that, that is not taken for granted. Um, so that's one thing that I think we should keep in mind and connect it to our responsibilities as adults when we want to cultivate that sort of dimension, openness that characterizes childhood, that there's a risk involved in returning to be a child. There's, there's a risk in, involved in refusing to take values for granted and in uh, philosophizing, for example, right? And I see it with my students, how shattering it can be to, to assume a reflective position, to, to critically reflect on our beliefs, values, and so forth. As a woman working in philosophy, as someone who is uh, interested in feminist theory and feminist philosophy, and as a teacher, uh, what I think is really crucial for us is to develop solidarity. Um, I think that there is a tendency to isolate us from each other and to um, inhibit genuine dialogue between us, between women scholars and feminist scholars. So I think, and that's what I try to do, um, I think that it's crucial to engage in living dialogues, disagree, but, you know, uh, read each other's work, um, think together about problems and questions that interest you, build connections, be part of a community, to become part of a living community, I think that is very crucial. And um, that's what I hope to um, facilitate for my students. And that's what I strive to have for myself as a scholar and as a teacher.